Good afternoon and welcome. Having chosen this venue for today's event, I decided to do some brief research on the Royal Institute and found that the RI describes itself on its website as an independent charity dedicated to connecting people with the world of science, which I think is particularly appropriate given today's theme, as the movie Elysium is a science fiction movie written and directed by South African-born Neil Blomkamp. For those who don't know me, I'm Roy Ettinger, a founder and the current CEO of the Credo Group. I'm going to run through this afternoon's program and introduce you to the cast of characters who will be appearing. Dion Kos, whom some of you will know, will play a leading role and will enlighten us all with his views on the current state of financial markets and on preparing for Elysium. In a very able supporting role, Ricky Shoka, one of Credo's equity analysts, will provide further insight into investing in equities in a digital age. And Jared Kahn, a director and senior portfolio manager, will bring the speeches to a close by giving you a sneak preview of the soon-to-be-launched Credo Special Opportunities Portfolio. This will be followed by a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, this will be the time to ask them. After Q&A, you're all invited to join us for refreshments in the mezzanine room where we were earlier. Before I hand over to Dion, I'll give a brief overview of Credo's progress since we founded the group 15 years ago. Today we have assets under administration of almost 1.3 billion pounds. 3,500 separate client accounts and a staff complement that has grown from 6 to almost 60. From our single office in London's Margaret Street, we now have offices in six cities around the world. And we're very much looking forward to moving to our new offices in Regent's Park in the new year and look forward to welcoming you all there. I want to thank all of you for giving up your time this afternoon to come in here are preparing for Elysium theme. I must admit that before Dion told me about the theme, I never knew what Elysium meant. But like any modern day fool, I was able to go to the internet for a definition and to see Elysium could be defined as a place or state of perfect happiness. For those Arsenal fans here, I want to specifically mention that we'll finish in time for you to get to the Emirates and I can guarantee you that because Dion is one of the gooners amongst us today. I very much hope that by 5.30 this afternoon, you will all, having heard from none of my colleagues, you will all be that much closer to Elysium. And to assist you in getting there, I'd like to hand over to Dion. Thank you, Roy. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. I just want to make sure that the um, microphone works, because I've got one of my own that I can walk out with. Okay. So as Roy said, he didn't know what Elysium was before, and I, I, to be honest, when I was um, on the Bakerloo line a few months ago, and I saw that ad, uh, a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, don't use tubes anymore, but they've got these ads up at the top. Um, and I saw this very attractive place called Elysium where there's no unemployment. By the way, that unemployment number of 197 million happens to be the number that's the official total statistic for the world if you go and look at the International Labour Organization's website. Um, it's not been updated for the last year, but I'm sure that Neil Blomkamp and I looked at the same page when we put together this, uh, when, we, when he put together this, this little teaser. I actually went uh, to that website that night because, as I say, I had no idea. I hadn't heard about the movies before the, long before the movie was launched. And on it's better of there.co.uk. I think you can still go and do it. You can, you can write a test, which is essentially an entrance examination for Elysium. If you manage to pass the test, please let me know. You'll be the first person to pass it. Um, not only do you have to buy your ticket into Elysium, but you've got to be pretty smart. And it's set up in a way where, as I said, I haven't found a way into Elysium. So it's unfortunately, unfortunately, <coughs> unfortunately not for me. For those of you who have not seen the movie, let me just summarize it and say it's very much like tonight's presentation. Uh, so it's ultimately, I think, a slightly uh, disconcerting picture about the future with hopefully an uplifting conclusion and a fair number of South African accents thrown in. For those of you who have seen the movie, you'll recognize me. I, I fulfill the role of a special agent Kruger, which basically means I've got the worst South African accent, but I've got to do all the dirty work, and that's why I've got to talk the longest. It's ultimately a story about us and them. So in the year 2154, 140 years into the future, 
That is what Neil Blomkamp projects Los Angeles to look like. Basically one big slum with lots of unemployment, lots of crime, lots of disease. But fortunately, the one thing that won't change in 140 years is that money will still make the world go around. And if you can afford it, you can buy your way into this place with perfect happiness, a place without disease, without crime, without unemployment, with no Miley Cyrus, no Nicholas Bentner, a place <laughs> of perfect happiness. But then if we're going to look 140 years in the future, we ask the question, where better to, to start but looking 140 years in the past? And fortunately, in the last month or so, you would have seen that this gentleman called Professor Robert Schiller from Yale won the Nobel Prize, um, jointly, I, I should say, but he's one of the co-recipients for this year's Nobel Prize in Economics. And essentially, it's for his work around what he refers to as the CAPE ratio, the cyclically adjusted PE ratio, which is on the left-hand side, yeah, on the vertical axis. Um, and if you look at the green line there, sorry, the green, the, uh, the blue line there, uh, it's, you can see that it's a graph that runs all the way back to 1871, about 140 years into the past. The reason it starts in 1871 is because that's frankly how much data is available for the S&P. It's the longest index that we can track. So with 140 years of earnings, uh, and looking at the cyclically adjusted P ratio, we'll talk about the adjustments in a moment. You can see what the shape of the graph looks like, the new line. Now it's just a squiggly line which may not seem to mean much to most people. You'll see it ends at a level of 23.8. But if you want to judge how expensive or cheap that is, I suggest you focus on the only two times in 140 years where it was actually any higher than that, being at the time of the 1929 crash, when Charlie Munger was five years old and Warren Buffett had not yet been born, um, and then again at the top of the tech bubble in 2000. So only twice in history has the market, on the whole, this is the S&P, has the market been more expensive than it is today at, a, at around 23.8. So that makes it look a little bit more expensive. And of course, what Schiller does is he doesn't look at the simple PE, which is just you know this year or next year's earnings uh, relative to the share price. He makes certain adjustments for factors that are ultimately, to summarize, unsustainable in terms of influencing the profitability of a company. And one of the clues is actually on the same graph. When it reappears, you can see I'm now focusing on the bottom there at the long-term interest rate line, which, as you can see, is as low as it's been for 140 years. And if you want to accuse us of the fact that 140 years is not enough history, uh, and, and I'm going to show you a graph now which you will not be able to read, but I'll try and decipher it for you. Because in the next graph, I'm going to show you interest rate history for 5,000 5, years. So if you can get 5,000 years into, into one graph, you can imagine you need a very small font. So here goes. This is 5,000 years of, of, of interest rate history. The first little bubble there, if you can see this, there is actually a little green point here, if anybody can see it. The first bubble there, it's the time of Mesopotamia, that's in 3000 BC. The interest rates were about 25%, which is roughly the same as www.wonga.com 5,000 years later. Uh, and then we go in the next bubble to thumb the Greeks um, at about 1000 BC. And then the next bubble there around uh, the birth of Christ, where the Romans were in charge. And then the next one there where the Italians had it, you can see they raised it up again. You know, trust the Italians to bring it up to about 50% again. And then more recently in America, down to close to zero. So that's what the interest rates have done. The, the lowest it's been in 5,000 years. So if anybody tells you this is a 5,000 year low interest rate, you know where that comes from. The second point is around profitability. And if you look at the green line there, you can see that the green line, the profitability of uh, industrial corporations, non-financial corporations, has been this high once or twice since the Second World War, but it's pretty much at the highest point, jointly the highest point that it's been in, let's say, 70 years or so. But then if you add banks to that, all corporations, if you add banks, you can see it's actually the highest ever. There's a bit of a survivorship bias in there because we've had the financial crisis and the weaker banks have either merged or they've folded or they've been rescued. Uh, but for those that are left behind, if you've got an interest line, if you've got a cost line that is effectively zero uh, and you can charge a margin of that and you can get it a few times, it's very great for profitability if you survive. Um, and ultimately, the capitalist system is such as we all know that with profit margins like that, um, the system should attract more competition and it's not really sustainable. And then lastly, is tax rates. We all know the corporate tax rates are as low as they've been, once again, since the Second World War. We've all lived through the Thatcherism and, and great economics of the 70s and 80s that basically really kicked us off or, or, or gave it some momentum. And today, tax rates, as we know, is fantastic. That's if you pay tax, that you've got Starbucks and Amazon that doesn't pay too much tax at all. Ultimately, we don't believe this is sustainable. Um, and if you look at the American government finances, it's a very busy graph, and there's really two sort of bits of color you need to focus on. First is the solid black line. 
Um, the cipher at the bottom left there is the debt to GDP ratio in the United States. And the black line will see ends on the right hand side, but read it off the left hand scale, it ends at 100%. So the debt to GDP today is about 100%. And then on the right hand side scale, the budget deficit is surplus. You can see these red bars, um, which are around 10% today. And the only times in history that either of these have been higher, or both of them have been higher together, have been when, when there were wars, hence the emphasis there. So when there's a war, governments typically don't really worry about their finances. They just print more bullets. But except for the wars, um, that's the only other times that have been high. And yet it's high today and at the time of the wars. And that is why every time that there's a, an opportunity for the Republicans and the Democrats to have a go at each other, we have these debt ceiling problems and we have the government shutdowns potentially. The first one we had this year for about 20 years. And they come and go and because ultimately they aren't a political posture. And the only real crisis about that is the fact that it's only the useful bits of government, such as uh, the museums and the national parks that close down and the bits that everybody wanted to close down, like the tax office, apparently stayed open. That's a real headline for the times. But returning to the Shula PE and this time bringing it to the UK market. So this is similar logic to before. This is similar to Schiller's uh, mathematics, if you like, in terms of adjusting the P-E ratios in the market. Uh, you'll see that it's uh, an emphasis on the, I can't even see my own green, green dot now, on the UK over there. And there, we've only got about 40 years history, because once again, for this data, that's, there's only 40 years of history available. And the shape of the line, the blue line there, for those of you who want the presentation, we can send it to you afterwards, and you can put this blue line on top of the the Schiller PE on the previous graph, and you'll see it's pretty much the same shape. It's the same sort of cyclicality over the same sort of periods. The extent is lower in the UK, and the, and the UK is in absolute terms not as expensive today as the, as the US, but it's a similar shape. And what we then do is we compare the Schiller PE in the UK over the last 40 years to the subsequent returns in the market if you invested at different points in time. And we take a 10-year view. That's the red dotted line. I will explain. Firstly, you will note that the red dotted line ends 10 years ago. Because for the red dotted line to have a next observation, it's we'll only know every you know ten years later exactly what sort of returns you had in the last ten years as, as time keeps on passing. So it has to be lagged essentially by those ten years. And to decipher this, if you bought, I'm going to walk in now because I don't like my own green dot. If you bought at the bottom of the market in the mid 70s or crisis time, then ten years later, this is the way to interpret the market or to interpret the graph, you would have made four times your money. That's just on the index on the on the. Um, um, in the UK market. You would have made four times your money if you bought at the bottom. If you bought at the top of the market, top of the tech bubble in 2000, go to the right hand side and hopefully you can see it's around one time. So you get your money back 10 years later because you bought at the top of the market. So you suffer the crash, you eventually, after 10 exciting years, you get your money back. And therefore the question is, to the extent that this equation holds, or this relative holds, if you buy today, if we were to forecast where that red dot might go, the red dotted line in 10 years time, and you read it off the right hand side, it's at a level of call it 1.8, and therefore it's an absolute return, not a real return, an absolute return of 6% per annum. It's not extremely exciting. Historically, it's been a good predictor uh, of stock returns, as we illustrated in the last slide. And that's why John Authors, who, for those of you on Twitter, if you want to follow one guy that tweets reasonable stuff on a daily basis, all the best uh, bits of the, of the FT, I suggest that you follow John Walters, and this is a tweet by John Walters at the end of August when we started thinking about this presentation. And basically this summarized all the gloom and doom in the world in only 140 characters, based on the kind of background that I've already just sketched. But this then was the backdrop to John Walters hosting what was a bit of a debate in the pages of the FT through the month of September, entitled uh, The Clash of the Cape Crusaders. So starting with Schiller, Schiller actually featured uh, in the very first article around that. Uh, you may recall an article called The Cape of Less Hope. That was the first article. That was the one that focused on Schiller's uh, Cape, the Cape of Less Hope being the, the, the Schiller Cape ratio. Not long after that, Jeremy Siegel came out in response. And Jeremy Siegel and Schiller uh, have been intellectual foes for probably the better part of 20 years now. Um, when the one is bullish, the other one turns berries and, and right about. In fact, Siegel is always bullish and Schiller is always berries. They, 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 at, at times, the, the fights just come into a little bit more perspective. Siegel, for those of you uh, who need reminding, uh, wrote this book, which is often quoted uh, in presentations like this, called Stops for the Long Run. The front page of the first edition of the book, which this one is, going back to 1994, shows there the red line, and that over 200 years, there's 200 years running along the, the bottom of the graph. You want to be in risk assets, you want to be, frankly, in equity. It will outperform anything else, or certainly it did for those 200 years <coughs> previously. And based on that, Siegel very much believe in a long-term risk assets uh, exposure, which ultimately 
uh, is similar to something that we will, we will be suggesting today as well. But it's not only uh, Schiller, I'm uh, sorry, it's not only Jeremy Siegel um, that's a bull either. In the same debate over the next few weeks of the, uh, of the Clash of the Cape Crusaders, um, there, there were other people that came out and were quoted. Now, you won't be able to read this, I'm afraid, unfortunately, the font is not friendly to us. But practically, those bullet points at the bottom there, if you did look at the full presentation, if you received a copy at some point in time, these are all the general uh, valuation measures that you know. These are typical PE ratios, historic PE ratios, PEG ratios, price to book ratios, EV to EBITDA, for those of you who have heard that alphabet soup. Um, all those ratios, the market looks either cheap or certainly not unreasonably expensive. It looks reasonable, or in fact on the cheap side, it's reasonable. Not on one of these measures does the market look that expensive. Um, the Cape is the only one where it looks very expensive uh, on a long-term basis. Um, and then, of course, the final word in this regard will belong to Schiller again. Schiller kicked it off by saying markets are too expensive and the Cape, um, you know, is, 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 is a dangerous kind of, at dangerous levels at 23.8. And he was saying, you know, yeah, you, you, can, you can throw all these other numbers at me. And I remember in, in 1998 and 1999, when I was also making bearish noises at the top of the tech bubble, that people were using things like price to eyeballs ratios against me. Because as you know, in those days, you know, you could list an internet company on a hundred times eyeballs. It didn't make any profit, so PE didn't make any sense. But let's go and count how many people have looked at the website and times it by 100, and then we've got a price for the company, price for eyeballs. And just to slip this in, that on a price to eyeballs ratio at 42.5 million pounds, I think that was actually a very cheap buy for us. In any event, the next couple of slides are very, very technical. And I don't suggest that you try and read you know, all of the sort of bullet points we've got there. Life is too short. I'll try and explain to you. What we do is we analyze different asset classes and we look at their returns over time and we divide that into different sort of decels from the best decel on the left hand side to the worst decel on the right hand side and these are 10 year performance numbers. Um, and what we, the only assumption we make, we, we ultimately roll the market forward from, from where it is today and we don't do it by guessing earnings of companies and you know economic growth and interest rates and you know exchange rate and gold price and whatnot. The only assumption we make is reversion to the mean. So if profit margins are higher than they used to be, we just assume reversion to the mean. If P ratios or ratings are higher than they used to be, we assume reversion to the mean. These are the same sort of assumptions, essentially, that Schiller does in his work. Uh, and then we compare that return that we get from different asset classes to the long-term history as per that graph there. Now you may note, for those cynics in the audience, say, why is this only from 1987? 26 years is a very short period of time. And you'd be right. Um, but the reason we do that is because that some of the asset classes that we do compare uh, when we do this work only has history for a shorter period. So for the S&P we can do it for around 140 years, but for some asset classes we can't. And it would be unfair to compare longer term to shorter term across asset classes. Um, the, 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 thankfully I can tell you, and we used, in a previous version of this presentation we showed this, the 100 year picture for the same graph that we showed is actually visually very similar. It differs by about a percent or so on each of those blocks. It's visually very similar. You just need to take my word for that tonight. But we do this across asset classes, and then we come up essentially with rankings going forward. And on the right hand side, you will see the numbers there. I want you to focus only on those, in yellow. When it says a 10 on the right hand side, it doesn't mean 10 out of 10 is good news. It means that your likely return going forward over the next 10 years is likely to be 10th decile. That's pretty bad. That's the worst possible place for those performances to be. So basically, you know, to cut a long story short, you don't want to be in investing in great bonds. Right at the bottom, you don't want to be at Euro European high yield bonds either, 8th decile. In the equities category, US equity and European equity, 8 to 9th DSL, not great. Emerging market equities, if you've got the stomach for it, um, second DSL, so that looks pretty good. Uh, and when we did a version of this presentation in South Africa not long ago, we go into a bit more detail here because people in, in, our, in our audience, they were not only exposed to emerging markets, they were living in one. Um, but the bottom line being that a big part of the reason, and I'll only share this one line, a big part of the reason why emerging markets look very cheap today is because they've suffered such a currency uh, hiccup in the last six months or so. So the markets themselves might not be that sell, but because of, because, of the, uh, because of the currency aspect, they just look historically cheap um, at this point in time. So the bottom line of all this is where do you put your money? Uh, because everything, really, most things, look pretty expensive. And that brings me to the conclusion of the first part of my presentation, which is, as you all know, the secret of having marriage is not looks or intelligence or money. But if you don't want to know what the answer is, who better to consult than that uh, famous philosopher who lives in Omaha, Nebraska, Mr. Warren Buffett, and this is a real quote from, from his wisdom, uh, where he said it's not looks or intelligence or money, but, but low expectations. Uh, and we believe that investors who have low expectations will not be disappointed because their expectations might be met. 
So what do we do then in this world of low expectations going forward? Uh, and we're only going to address a few themes very, very briefly. I'm going to introduce about two or three of them. And then my colleague Ricky Shoyden will take over from me and introduce one more in a bit more detail. And then Jared will wrap up a little bit later. So in spite of the fact that, uh, that emerging markets may be superficially cheap at this point in time, we, we may think new world, but we typically invest old world. And the, and the reason we do that is that we, if we invest in the old world, we believe we know what we can get. This is the front page. Um, from the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Competitiveness Index, which is uh, updated every year in the third quarter. Um, I do recommend you, those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, to go to the website. It's a very interesting and interactive website. And this is just, for example, the front page of the American aspect. So you can see there, uh, if you can read it, in the black block at the top there, the US is the fifth most competitive market in the world. This is out of 148 markets that they measure. So 5 out of 148 is not a bad number, especially if you're talking about the biggest market. The biggest market in the world, market size is one, is the fifth most competitive. If you look at all the metrics that are there, if you can read them, uh, you probably battle to read them. Um, the institutions, the infrastructure, macroeconomics, health and primary, bioeducation, etc., business sophistication, innovation on the right hand side. All the measures, if you can read them, they're in the top quarter, except for one. They are 117 in terms of macroeconomics. I think the fact that the US bankrupt has something to do with it. But except for that one minor hiccup, everything else is in the top quarter. So you've got the world's biggest market which is the most competitive with every stat statistic in the, in, in the top quartile and therefore a lot of our companies that we prefer to invest in would be in America rather than in an exciting emerging market. In America essentially led us into the crisis and the early evidence is that they are leading us out of the crisis as well. So you've got the biggest market in the world um, that has turned around first in terms of the economist, the recent updates in terms of the turnaround in economic growth. We invest in American companies not only because we like American exposure. This is just a little interesting graph about where McDonald's sell hamburgers. I mean, you can see all the red companies in the world is where McDonald's has exposure. So we buy McDonald's not only because it's an American company, but that's the best way as far as we're concerned to buy emerging markets, is to buy companies like that, companies that can benefit from the emerging market boom and the demographic boom that, that's, uh, that's, in, that's in emerging markets. The South African audiences, I typically say that a company like Diageo, UK company, only sells about 10% of its products in the UK today, but they sell more you know, blue label to the South African government than they do in the whole of England um, on an annual basis. Um, so you buy the international exposure by buying these kind of companies. In terms of our portfolio, the companies are listed in the UK more than half, with about a quarter listed in the US, and yet in terms of the e effective economic exposure on a look-through basis, you can see the picture looks quite different. So more than half the stocks in that grayish color in the first buy um, are from the UK, but then uh, if you look at the uh, sort of the light blue color at the, uh, at the bottom of the second part for Europe, that's Europe including the UK. 30% Europe including the UK is where the exposure is. Another way of cutting the pie is to, just to say emerging versus, versus, um, versus developed. We have no emerging market companies as such, unless you count Samsung as an emerging market exposure, which you're welcome to do, uh, but we see it as a first world company. That, that's the only emerging market company as such um, that, that we hold. Um, but we have 34% we have emerging market exposure. The second theme, and I'm only going to touch on this briefly, is that it's important to understand uh, demographics because macroeconomists will often preach doom and gloom and tell you about, uh, about aging populations and declining populations and the fact that there are now more diapers uh, sold in Japan to old people than to babies. Uh, that's a real statistic. Uh, and therefore, that can't be great for consumption and for companies like SAB that try to sell beer and that kind of thing. And that may be true. But what we think they're missing is that on a slightly uh, secular basis, uh, and this is from the United Nations, this is not from Peter's projections, uh, there are parts of the world that are still growing very, very strongly. And, and Africa uh, is the one big opportunity where Africa will go from a, a billion people today to about four billion people in the year 2100. Africa today is half of Europe plus North America plus South America combined. It will be four times those three regions combined in less than 100 years' time. And therefore, if you can participate in that, um, a country like Nigeria, for example, has more babies born on a daily basis than are born in the whole of, than are born in the whole of, um, of, of Western Europe. Uh, I heard a statistic today from my one colleague who attended a conference. It's on a slightly different point. It's not about, it's not about Africa. But that apparently in the last three years in China, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this, this uh, statistic. In the last three years in China, they've consumed more concrete and cement than in the previous hundred years in America. Um, that's just the way that some of these emerging markets are, 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 are steaming ahead. Um, and if you can participate in companies that can benefit from this, then we believe that, there are, that there's tremendous uh, opportunity in that. And then finally, it's a fairly big call, and once again, I've 
mentioned macroeconomists before, if there's macroeconomists in, the, in the audience, you may want to argue about me about the future of inflation. Because in spite of the very low interest rates for the last, let's say, five years or so, inflation hasn't really you know, reared, reared its head in any sort of ugly manner yet. Um, and there's the whole argument about the velocity of money, which is not quite there yet. So yes, you've got cheap money on the one side of the balance sheet, but unless you lend it out a few times, and unless you've got the multiplier working for you, the economic growth and, and the inflation doesn't really happen. So that may be the case, but we believe that this is the one ultimate bubble that's probably building with a longer term view. Whether it's going to take a few years or five to ten years before it really, really becomes a problem, you know, time will tell. But we believe that you need to make it your friend. And you, need, you, you make inflation your friend by being in risk assets. And that can either be the equities of companies that have pricing power. It could be, frankly, uh, in terms of other hard assets. And I'll come to an example of that in a moment. Um, if, if you go and look at a long-term graph, this is the last 800 years of, of inflation. Since we've had Bretton Woods, there's not been a period of sustained deflation in the world. Um, countries can print money as we know, you know, like it goes out of fashion, and ultimately it must be inflationary. The question is when it will start picking up. I've shown you earlier the credo numbers that suggest that, remember where emerging markets were second decile and uh, everything else looked pretty bad? The logic of that we borrowed from GMO. GMO is a very reputable firm, headquartered in Boston. Jeremy Grant is the founder, he's the G in GMO. Um, and they do similar work. I'm not going to focus on all these bars, but you'll see that the sort of positioning of these bars are actually very similar to what we come, come up with in terms of what seems cheap and what seems expensive. The one I do want to emphasize is the one on the right hand side, which is timber, hard asset. Now, we didn't price that. We can't really invest in hard assets for our clients because it's difficult to find something that's investable, that's liquid. That's regulated, that compliance will sign off, and we've got our full compliance team regulated to make sure that I say that. Um, so we can't really invest in timber um, for, for our clients. But the reason that timber looks so good is ultimately that inflation call. It's, it's something we have made inflation a friend. That's just an example of it. Um, I saw in the Sunday Times about a month ago this little survey about what's happened to various aspects of cost of living. Um, we're focusing, we can't kind of have a conversation in London for more than half an hour, not mention either schools or the weather or house prices. So I'll mention house prices. Um, and you can see that since 1980, house prices, the average house price in the UK, as no doubt we all know, has gone up about 10,000, from 23,000 to 247,000. And uh, we sort of look at where our, where our responses came from, and uh, I can tell you the way that average response in this audience comes from northwest London. So I, I looked at what you can get in northwest London for 247,000. And there was a guy price. This is a real example. If you negotiate a bit, you can get this for 247,000 in Ulysses Road, West Hampstead. It's a nice enough uh, Georgian frontage. Um, you've got a nice kitchen there with a view of the neighbor's wall as well as the own toilet. Um, and that's your room. And if you think I'm exaggerating, that's the floor plan. It's uh, 17 square meters. That's the size of a big single garage. Um, and of course, that's what you can get today for 250000 And we ask the question that if you have the same 7.37% compound growth uh, in property prices that we had since 1980, uh, and those are just from the numbers that were there, what do you think this will cost at the time of Elysium? You know, so for your great-grandchild moving out of that flat in West Hampstead uh, into Elysium, what do, you, what do you think you'll be able to sell that property for, um, given this kind of growth? This is just a little exercise, a little trivial exercise in, in the law of compounding. Uh, one, million. one billion. It's a pretty good guess. It's 5.6 billion. Um, so that's just the way it is. You, you, we, we could have chosen a, you know, a McDonald's hamburger or something similar. The numbers might not have been that extreme. But be that as it may, ultimately we believe in some form of risk assets. So whether it's the right kind of property, and I'm not suggesting that that price in West Hampstead will be the best possible investment, or whether it's stocks, stocks and companies that have pricing power, as I suggested before. You have to make risk your friend. Risk and, risk and inflation go hand in hand, ultimately. Uh, and if you make risk your friend, um, and if you embrace risk, uh, and if you respect risk, risk will reward you, we believe, uh, in the longer term. My colleague, as I said, Ricky Shaker will take over for me in a minute or two, uh, and he will um, talk about the digital age. Unfortunately, I was born before 1970, so I'm not qualified to do that. Um, and therefore, I need to conclude at this point in time and say that there's this old Irish saying that there are fish in the sea better than I've ever been caught. There will always be opportunities to invest in, if you make inflation your friend, if you make risk your friend. Um, and if you don't do that, uh, for at least a portion of your portfolio, we believe you'll pay the price, the price as measured by opportunity cost. And that's the only way that your kids will be able to live in a lease. And the choice is really yours. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you embrace risk, to the, to the appropriate extent. It depends on your own personal circumstances and your own risk profile. Um, but if you embrace it to the, to the appropriate extent, we believe that is the right strategy to follow. My final slide is one with the basic So because people ask me, when is this all going to end? I actually, um, 
realized today that in the last week, three of the best bears that I've ever met, I've been privileged to meet them all at conferences and other events over the years, uh, have all turned bullish in the last week. And these are Mark Faber and Jeremy Grantham, whose name I mentioned a little bit earlier, and then Hugh Henry, a hedge fund manager in London. They've all turned a bit bullish this last week. Um, and I think it's because of this, you know, it's difficult to keep on fighting TV. They've all been bearish up, up until this point in time. Who knows where exactly market will be in a year's time. But between now and, you know, whenever QE may be stopping and, you know, the, the next issue comes onto the agenda, we believe markets will do what they always do. And that is what they picture the pits. Uh, they will climb a wall of worry. They will continue climbing the wall of worry. That's what they've always done. That's what they'll continue to do. If you don't recognize me there, that's me in the middle there, climbing the wall of worry on the off flights. Uh, if, you, if you don't believe me, you can go and look at my Twitter profile and you'll see that's my picture on Twitter. You're welcome to go and click on, on that tonight and become my 307th follower. Um, if you do so, I'll still be 46 and a half million behind Justin Timberlake. Um, but so be it. And the spirit of Twitter, I just want to close up and say, you know, hashtag, thank you for your time and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dion, for that very cheerful and optimistic uh, presentation. Um, I have to confess something. This isn't the first time that I've delivered this presentation. Um, I actually go to a number of times in uh, South Africa. Um, and the good thing about that is that you get to practice uh, the presentation itself and also a few jokes. Um, unfortunately, in my instance, none of the jokes worked. So there'll be no humor in my uh, presentation today. <laughs> Um, but I also recognize there's a few ex-South Africans in the audience today, so what I did want to do is share a story with you. Just to let you know that I'm very lucky to, to be back from South Africa and kind of make it back in one piece. Um, and the reason for that is I was constantly reminded before I left um, that I looked uh, like a very, uh, very famous South African, or rather British, uh, Asian chap called Sri and Divine. And I wasn't sure if I was going to make it back in one piece. <laughs> But uh, nevertheless, I'm here to present to you uh, about investing in the digital age. Now, I'm sure a number of you have seen this. This is Darwinism at its very finest. Um, and it's effectively showing how we've gone from a fairly primitive species to one that is far more sophisticated and advanced. Um, and we've moved here from, I don't think this will, okay, here we go. Um, so we've gone from, uh, uh, from the agricultural age here, um, and then moved over to the industrial age, and now to what we call the digital age. What you'll also notice is this thing in the, uh, in the end here is PC. Um, it's not really as relevant anymore. Uh, in fact, it's only really prevalent in the, uh, in the workplace. I mean, at home, you're typically using other devices. Um, therefore, someone's actually taken the initiative to update this. Um, and it now looks like this. So this is how we're moving through the digital age. And it's showing how we're now rising again as a race, where, where we're becoming more technologically uh, evolved, um, more advanced, uh, we're, we're standing up again. Um, and what you're seeing here are a couple of new devices. So this is slowly becoming a little obsolete. Um, you've got the iPad here, this chap's wearing Google glasses, and this is meant to be a Samsung uh, Galaxy Gear watch. Um, so it's really now becoming about uh, a wearable technology. Um, and what you're seeing here are really two things, two laws. The first one is Bell's law. Uh, what Bell said uh, many years ago um, is that computers will evolve, uh, but some features will die out. Um, and that's what's happening in the middle here. But more importantly, there was another chap uh, called Gordon uh, Moore. Uh, and what Moore said in Moore's Law um, is that every one to two years, uh, the computing and uh, processing power uh, of various technological and electronic devices will double. And that's exactly what we've seen. Uh, over the past uh, kind of 20 years. Now, many of you may have heard of Generation Y. Um, they're also known as the generation of twerkers, a uh, generation of selfies. Um, in fact, selfie was actually, on a side note, uh, uh, for 2013 voted word of the year um, alongside uh, twerking. But more formally, they're actually the population born uh, between the 1980s and the 2000s. Um, but more importantly, they're actually the first generation to grow up with PCs in their households. Um, and that's very important for a number of reasons, which I'll come on to very shortly. Uh, but there was a book written um, at the beginning of 2000 uh, by two individuals. Uh, the book was called Nine Shifts. Uh, what they said in Nine Shifts is that by the year 2020, i.e. over that 20-year uh, period, 75% of what we do on a daily basis will be different. Uh, and that's discretionary stuff. Uh, and the exact same thing happened when we moved from the industrial age 
flow from the agricultural age to the industrial age. Um, and the same thing happens also when we move from the industrial age and to the digital age. But what they have to say about Generation Y is quite interesting. Um, they say Generation Y have very different beliefs, values, and attitudes to previous generations. And the main reason for that is in response to the technological and economic implications of the internet. Um, and why is all of that important? It's, in record, it's important because of this graph here, or rather this picture. Uh, and what it's showing is the world population demographically from 2015 up to 2014. Um, and this orange thing here that you see, these are the millennials or Generation Y. Um, and what it's showing is that by 2040, they will make up the vast majority of the population in the world today. Um, and there's also this maroon thing here, or, or dark kind of red, and this is called the next generation. Who are the next generation? And the ge next generation also referred to as Generation Z. This is Generation Z. They are the population of the, uh, I'd say the 40% or so of toddlers now who are under the age of two that can actually use tablets before they can speak. Um, so for those of you who are thinking of buying a rattle or a toy or a, uh, or a book for Christmas, scrap that idea. If you've got a toddler, go and buy an iPad. So, so this is actually very important uh, for a number of reasons. Um, because you've got these technological changes going on. Uh, and you've also got demographic shifts in the population. Um, and that, what that's essentially doing is changing the way we do a lot of things today. Um, it's changing the way that we learn, where you can see this chap here learning. Uh, it's changing the way that we interact with one another. I'm sure he or she has got a Twitter or a Facebook account. Um, but as you'll see on this slide, it's actually changing also the way that we shop. Um, so what's happening here, you've got this, this young lady, she's gone into a shop, she's looking for a perfect pair of high heels. Um, and eventually this uh, assistant fi uh, finds her a pair um, and she says, this pair is so perfect, I can't wait to buy them online somewhere, watch your Wi-Fi password. Um, and this is a problem that's facing a number of retailers today as well. Uh, and there are real examples of this going on. Uh, now I'm sure a number of you have heard of Jessup's, it was very prevalent and it, it still is to an extent uh, in the UK retail space. Um, at the height of its success it had hundreds of stores all around the UK. Uh, but at the beginning of this year, it actually uh, filed for administration. Um, now, I'm sure you've all got, uh, you've got your theories as to why, um, but there is one specific company that can be blamed. For those of you that weren't sure or slightly uncertain, the staff at Jessup's have actually identified who the culprit is. So it's Amazon in this instance, and it's a way that everything is really just shifting online, and we've had the mobility of di uh, devices. Um, now, we're not just seeing this in the, uh, in the retail space, we're also seeing a lot of this disruption because of the move to the digital age uh, in a number of other uh, industries. One is media. So here's, an, uh, here's a chap, his name is Sohab Akhtar. Uh, for all you avid uh, cricketers, uh, cricket fans out there, not to be confused with the Pakistani fast bowler. Um, I actually hadn't heard, for, uh, heard of him before I put this presentation together. Um, and to be fair, I wouldn't expect you to have either. The reason is, he's actually just an IT consultant taking a break from the rat race, and he's hiding up in the mountains with all these laptops. But there's actually a lot more to him than that. The reason is, he was actually the uh, chap who live blogged the Osama bin Laden raid without knowing it. And here is a screenshot of a few of his tweets that he actually sent out on that eventful evening. So he says, there's a helicopter hovering above a Bhattabhad at 1 a.m. It's a rare event. This huge window is shaped with a bang here. I hope it's not the start of something nasty. And then finally, he says, a few people online at this time of night were saying that one of the copters was not Pakistani. Now, if you look back about a decade ago, this chap probably wouldn't have had the internet, let alone broadband uh, up in the mountains in Pakistan. Uh, and Twitter also wasn't about. But this news actually broke on Twitter first. And eventually, people put two and two together, and they figured out exactly what was going on before a lot of the news channels did. Um, but what it's really showing is how things are now shifting. Uh, the way news is breaking around the world, it's all shifted. Um, and there are a few companies that are benefiting from this trend, and a few that aren't. So what I'm going to show you in the next slide, I'm going to focus on one area um, where we're seeing really the most disruption. It's something that I touched on earlier, uh, and that's really within retail. Um, and within retail, um, one of the uh, key disruptors has been the online world. Um, and it's where we're seeing e -cons. Um, so what I've put together here is a version of the e-commerce value chain. There are various segments within that. Uh, we can all debate about which ones are correct or not. But this is just a version of, of, of sort of how I would see the e-commerce value chain today. And effectively, this is how it looks. So if you're going to buy something on the internet, the first thing you need is an access device. 
Um, ten years ago, you probably would have used your HP laptop. Today, it's more likely to be your iPad uh, or your uh, or your Galaxy uh, phone. You then need to be onto the internet. Um, if you're mobile, you use Verizon or Vodafone or Orange in the UK, um, or otherwise you do it from home. You use broadband available from Skype. You then, most importantly, need a commerce platform, very much like a, a physical storefront, but online. Um, and in that respect, there's a number of companies that operate within that space. And then once you've made your order, you've paid for your purchase uh, for your item, you then need the fulfillment. You need someone to actually deliver the item to you. Um, and there's a number of companies. You've got TNT and DHL. They mainly operate within Europe. And then you've got uh, FedEx and UPS, who, uh, who uh, are kind of more prevalent in the US. But this whole process that I've showed you is actually becoming very technologically sophisticated, uh, very tech heavy. So as a result of that, you also need a number of companies that will provide various services within that space. Uh, so you've got Accenture with their consulting, uh, Microsoft and Oracle both provide databases, uh, and then Salesforce.com with their uh, cloud application uh, development platform. Now within this, we own a, a, a number of companies, uh, which I'll just highlight here. I'm not going to go into any of these in any specific detail, but if there's anything or any one company that you wish to discuss after the break, uh, uh, then I'd be happy to do so. Um, but within that, I want to point out uh, kind of really just one thing. Um, and it's that if you want to invest in the e-commerce value chain, you don't just have to buy a technology stock for a retailer. Uh, you could argue the, the, the main one that kind of falls under that, uh, that camp is eBay. Um, but three out of the seven companies that I've identified there aren't actually tech companies. Uh, so you've got Sky, FedEx, and UPS, which uh, actually fall outside of that bracket. So there are a number of companies that are benefiting uh, indirectly from this whole e-commerce kind of trend. Now, I don't just want to talk, uh, talk about e-commerce. I do briefly also just want to touch on uh, another, another area where you're seeing a bit of disruption and evolution. This is a cover from the Nat Geo magazine uh, that was issued uh, a few months ago. Um, and what it's showing is really is that through various technological innovations, um, <coughs> mapping the genome, um, that a number of these babies will live uh, up to the years of 120, uh, which is quite astonishing, really. Um, and, and what we're really seeing here is the technological advancement in uh, medic uh, medicine. So you've got all this technology applied to, to, to mapping the genes, um, and it's becoming much more cost effective. It used to be a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars rather uh, to map a gene a number of years ago, and now it's fallen down to a hundred dollars. Uh, so you're seeing Moore's law also being applied uh, in the medical world. Um, and there are obvious companies that you could invest in to benefit from this trend. Uh, you could have Roche, GSK, uh, your Pfizer of the world, all the large cap uh, pharmaceutical companies. But there is also actually a very uh, another kind of interesting twist here. Um, Google announced uh, approximately three months ago uh, that they actually found a new way to retain staff. So it's a new staff retention policy that they're putting together. Um, and the trick was that they were finding a cure to old age. Uh, so they've actually invested uh, seriously in, in, in this uh, uh, venture, it's called uh, Calico. They've invested about a billion dollars in it so far. Uh, and they're effectively trying to find the, uh, the secret to immortal life. Uh, and they're looking to offer that to their employees. Now, before you will rush off and quit your jobs and, and, and try and find a position at Google, I'm told that they would also be offering this to shareholders. So uh, <laughs> you can actually benefit from that uh, in, in that respect also. Now, I just want to leave you with this one final thought. Um, I started the uh, presentation quoting Charles Darwin. I also want to finish quoting Charles Darwin. Uh, not only was he a geologist uh, and naturalist, um, he was also famous for another reason. He was actually an investment uh, philosopher. Uh, he just didn't know it. Uh, and the reason is, all he had to do was uh, uh, rearrange this quote here that he put together, a famous quote, and then I've now rearranged it. And it reads, it's not the strongest company that survived, who are the most intelligent, the ones that are most responsive to change. Thank you. That's going to pass you now to Thank you, Ricky. Uh, for you, for you people out there who don't know me, I'm Jared Kahn. I'm a director, senior portfolio manager at Credo. And today I'm going to talk about the launch of our special opportunities portfolio, which we're looking to launch beginning of next year. However, <clears throat> before I get into that, I just need to briefly take you through Credo's investment philosophy. Um, and this philosophy is something that you would have seen through
through investment proposals um, and with interaction with our clients. And it's really quite a simple philosophy and it's a very long-term philosophy. Ideally, at the, at the outset, we are fiduciaries of your money. So wealth preservation and creation is, is paramount to what we look to do for our clients. Uh, we are very long-term in what we do uh, and we have a low turnover strategy. Uh, we're not a churning or a kind of bucket shop type of organization. Uh, we follow a value-based approach, um, and we also have uh, portfolios that are unconstrained, so we don't benchmark HUD, um, and we have high conviction. So the portfolios I'll show you are 20 stock portfolios. Diversification is key. Yield is one of the aspects that uh, we look at in the portfolios. Um, and we are strategically focused, so the daily news flow, which is really important when you talk about U.S. stocks and earnings analyst estimates that you come on every quarter and profit warnings, we, we view this as noise, really. Um, we like to view companies as long-term. We view the noise as really buying opportunities. Um, and again, the risk that we look at is to find as your loss of capital. Uh, so capital preservation, again, is paramount. Bearing this in mind, we just drill down a little bit further into our investment process. Um, and you've probably seen this quite a few times if you've been to uh, an investment house um, presentations. But we start with the global universals of over 1,000 stocks, market cap is going to be large, 5 billion or so, and we screen for certain um, criteria to meet. And you'll see the, the slight breakdown of the best ideas versus the dividend growth portfolio. We're looking for fundamentally cheap or fair value companies. The dividend growth portfolio is slightly different in that we have a focus on dividend yield and dividend growth. Um, Analysis of the companies are saying we look for the best of breed, great management, high margins, economic growth, <coughs> everything you would expect to see in basically a Warren Buffett manual. And then you construct a portfolio of, as I said, high conviction, 20 stock portfolio that we put together. Taking this philosophy into account, um, we then come up with really the two flagship portfolios that we run today. The first one being the, the Credo Best Ideas portfolio. That was launched in April 2011. A developed stock portfolio, so as Dion alluded to, we don't hold many emerging stocks. In fact, Samsung is the only stock we hold in that portfolio. Uh, and we look for sustainable excess returns. And the returns have been pleasing. We've had a close to 36% return um, versus the MSCI World Index of just shy of 29% return over uh, a similar period of time. On the back of the success of this, um, and looking for something different, as most clients have been looking for, which is yield, we launched uh, in December 2012, the dividend growth portfolio. <coughs> the criteria are very similar, effectively, between best ideas and dividend growth, but again, the focus is different in that this is a yield portfolio, looking for yield <coughs> stocks, but also companies that will grow their earnings and grow their, their dividend yield. So it's not these value trap kind of stocks. Again, very pleasing returns, 26% uh, return versus the MSCI, which is just shy of 22, just over 22% during the same period of time. So now I'm going to talk slightly uh, again about a new portfolio that we're looking to launch um, at the beginning of next year. It's the Special Opportunities Portfolio. Um, a few characteristics of this portfolio um, which will be quite different to what you see in the two other portfolios. So again, high conviction portfolio, but whereas we had said 20 stock portfolio before, we're going to be a far more concentrated portfolio between 70 and 15 stocks. We don't quite have the actual number yet, but it's going to be opportunistic. It's going to be um, a bottom-up bottom approach. So as we see a stock, we'll add it to the portfolio. But we'll probably land up with a number closer to 10. Uh, market capitalization will be relaxed. So in the other portfolios where you've got a 5 billion uh, market cap minimum, here we will be unconstrained. But liquidity will be paramount. If we need to move in and out of the stock, we need to make sure that we have the capacity to move quickly and not to pressure our clients in any way. Um, holding periods will be relaxed, um, and that goes with higher turnover. These portfolio, this portfolio will be a far more aggressively, we don't want to use the word traded portfolio, but we'll have a lower holding period. So unlike the other portfolios, which we look to buy the stocks for periods of anywhere between three to 10 years, this is going to be a portfolio that will have a higher trading bias. Um, and for that reason, entry and exit points do matter because pricing, we will have pricing sensitivity. Um, and the catalyst for the investment in these kind of stocks can be any number of things. Um, and I've just listed a few there. Profit warnings um, are very opportunistic. Um, 
companies, or should I say analysts, tend to, to panic, investors panic, and they very much overreact uh, when certain circumstances appear. And we look at those as potential opportunities to enter stocks that we've been following. Uh, restructurings, IPOs, takeovers, placings, a number of things may create the catalyst to invest in these type of companies. Um, and again, it's really coupled with this concept of temporary mispricing. Um, and as I mentioned before, this will be a bottom-up portfolio. So to give you a further taste of the type of stock we would look to own in a portfolio like this, I've kind of uh, centralized it to the UK idea, um, and it's Lloyd's. And Lloyd's is actually a real case example where we've invested for our slightly more aggressive clients at a point in time. And for many years now, since the crisis began, I think a lot of people would argue that the banking sector has really been almost uninvestable. Uh, we happen to own historically HSBC in our best ideas portfolio because we believe, we believe that from a capital point of view and from a diversification point of view, it was far less risky than a more UK-centric bank. But interestingly, in the end of April this year, uh, Lloyd's released their, their results. And the results, as far as uh, we were concerned, were ex exceptional. They were really, really good. And the reason was everything that was bad about the market, everything that was bad about Lloyd's in the past seemed to be dissipating. Things like PPI claims, things like um, impediments, things like um, um, compliance, everything that seemed to be drifting backwards. Capital tier one ratio is increasing. Um, and this gave us a very positive slant on the stock. And just looking a little bit further into the future, we took the view that it wouldn't be a long time in the future where you would see Lloyd starting to pay a dividend again. And that dividend could be only maybe two or three P. But on a share price of 55 P, you could envisage in two to three years time, as we still do, a dividend of about five P, which put the stock on about a 10% dividend yield. So just on a dividend play in itself, we believe there was an opportunity. So we did buy the stock for clients around 55p. And we've been fortunate that we've had um, good economic data out of the, the UK, a very strong housing market, and um, things like the government reducing its stake from 38% to 32%. Again, another headwind uh, we would anticipate, which is now going to turn into a tailwind. And so we think Lloyd's is a typical type of example that would fit that type of portfolio. Uh, maybe not in the best ideas portfolio because the long-term visibility in the stock wasn't quite clear. Not in the dividend yield portfolio because there was no dividend, or there still is no dividend. But certainly an opportunistic uh, entry point for the stock. And again, you know, even at these levels of 75p, uh, there seems to be quite a lot of upside left in the stock. Um, just again, tactically, uh, where we see this, you know, in terms of where our clients' portfolios are right now, we do have standalone portfolios which we see as silos. So best ideas portfolio, dividend growth are both standalone. A lot of clients like to combine these portfolios. There is an overlap because of the same criteria we use in investing them. So you do get a, a, a large diversified portfolio of about 35 stocks between the two. Um, but now bringing the special opportunities portfolio into account, we think tactically this could be a core satellite type of approach. So clients could look to put it on top of a dividend growth portfolio, maybe on top of a best ideas portfolio, or if the portfolio size is large enough, um, add it to a portfolio with a tactical allocation of combined best ideas, dividend, and special opportunities. So as I said, uh, we're looking to launch the portfolio first quarter of 2014. Uh, we're pretty excited about the opportunity. Um, and uh, I'd just like to conclude on that. <laughs> I guess that's time for questions if there are any. Before I can rush off to him, the Emirates, you, my colleagues. No one got anything to say? Go for refreshments. Well, Chris, um, I think John mentioned earlier about demographics being overplayed. Um, and I was just quite interested why you've led to that. Um, I'm not sure it was over or under, but Dion, maybe you want to. The yeah, impact of yeah, that playing into tax and drawdown on markets, etc. The top heavy yeah, European and American markets. I think what I said it there's a demographics being overplayed is in the context of specific markets. Um, I just want to make sure that we're on the same way here with your question. Mm -hmm. That it's often mentioned that because of the aging population or declining population in some of the developed markets, uh, that that's bad because the economy gets safe. Um, 
So I'm not just focusing on the, on the, on the sort of macroeconomic side because of tax revenue. Tax revenue is going to like the you, you can have that focus as well. And that would certainly be true if you were looking at a, I don't know, at a, an SAB today or a DAJ for that matter. That's a specific markets where you know the cons consumption, the consumable um, um, consumption ability, if you like, will be declining from a demographic focus. But, but two things, one is you've got a long-term focus, and two is you've got a global focus. We believe that the pockets of, of opportunity just move around. That's really my point. So if you've got a narrow focus with a domestic company in Japan, for example, a consumer company, that's bad news. But if that Japanese company manages to spread its wings and you know, manages to go to build shops in Nigeria, for example, depending on what business they have, then I think it's good news. I mean, that's ultimately the, the point I'm trying to make. So I'm not denying that there's a demographic issue at a micro level for specific businesses in specific countries. I'm saying that on a global basis, there's more opportunity than there's a problem on a longer term. If you're interested in these things, no doubt you know the work of, uh, of a guy called Dr. Hans Rosling. I don't know if you um, know his work. He was actually, a lot of you may have seen, because about two weeks ago, as recently as that, there was a very informative program uh, on the BBC. Where he, he's a demographics expert. He's also well known for the fact that he's like the fun guy when it comes to statistics. He makes statistics fun. And if I can recommend one thing, there's a bit of compelling view, and I actually shared the link with my colleagues about a week ago, because this, this used to be available on the BBC website, but you can only see it there for a week. And then subsequently, that he's got special permission now that on his own website, he, he, this, this program is available for a limited period. It's, it's available as we speak. Um, he's got a website called getminder.com. So if you go to Gapminder, you just need to remember that, or oh, his name for that matter. Go look at a program, it's an hour about demographics, and it's ultimately the good news story around demographics. And in fact, one of the best conclusions you've got to summarize all his work is that, um, that yes, this, the fact that Africa is growing from 1 billion to 4 billion might not be good news in everybody's book because you must look at the sustainability of food and water and those kind of things. But ultimately, it is suggested, and that's what the United Nations number showed, the same numbers I showed you, because Rosling uses the same numbers. The world will top out the total global population of about 11 billion. It will never, it never is a long time, but according to all these projections and what happens to birth rates as countries develop, um, ultimately that's the, that, the population 2100, it'll never, it'll never, never is a long time, it'll never grow higher than that. And it, and it re relates to education and, and, and living standards as it's developed through the ages. So basically Africa may still be great, but they will go, go through the same trends that America and other places did a long time ago. Ultimately, it's a bullish program. Um, it's a bullish story that Hans Rosten wants to put forward. It's fantastic. And, and as I say, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you, you make statistics and graphs fun. Tony? When the uh, inflation GD does come back, you know, um, how will equities perform? And then in liquid assets, how can you protect yourself against that? Well, Tony, I, I think ultimately, how will equities perform? I mean, uh, I guess it depends on which equities, because I think the different equities will, are likely to perform, to perform differently. But the point being that the only place to be when inflation does come back, as far as I'm concerned, are certain kinds of risk assets where you can protect yourself against them. So some equities where, as I say, we've got pricing power. You know, if, you, if, you're a, if you're a food company or a food retailer for that matter, it doesn't matter what, how much inflation there is, you'll still be able to do business. Um, if you've got a regulatory constraint, you know, like power companies might have, you know, the hiccups that we saw recently with, some of the labor companies from Marks and Bandera, the our companies. You know, that's, that's not great for these companies, but ultimately I think that's unsustainable. I think the companies will go out of business if you try and regulate them too much. Similar to the kind of stuff that I saw today in the newspapers about the, about the payday lenders. I, you know, I teased about Wonga earlier, but, but I, I can't believe it that politicians try and get involved in these kind of things because the market solutions are ultimately better than what anything the politicians can come up with. So I'll go through short term hiccups as far as this is concerned. But you know, in the long term, I believe in the capitalist system, companies will survive, um, and some better than others from an inflation point of view. So I will, I will, I will, equities perform, I think different, different sectors will perform better than others. As I say, if it, the, the key is to look for either real assets or pricing down, um, but they go hand in hand. Timber is a real asset, agricultural land is a real asset, um, and, and those things will continue to benefit. You know, a, a one bedroom flat in West Amsterdam, you know, maybe at the top already in terms of the real terms. Uh, but agricultural land, and timber, those kind of things, and any company that's got, that will have pricing power, I think it's likely to do well. Tony, was there a second question about liquid assets? How do you can, protect uh, yourself if you've got liquid? Yeah, can you get exposure to those real assets in liquid, liquid form? Um, I actually have a colleague here that's a bigger expert than me when it comes to these categories. Maybe I'll hand over to him. I used to tell you how fun asset. Um, the typical asset is not liquid. Um, so if you, you know, if, if, you, if you don't need regulation on your side, so if you don't have a compliance department that looks over your shoulder, and you, and you can't stomach the longer term you know, lockup, 
And certainly there's lots of opportunity. Actually, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. And there's our fund expert in there. There's an um, expert on hundreds of funds in the world. So it's certainly on the, uh, if, you, if you're looking for liquidity, you're going to have to take a bit of extra risk for some of those that are listed. Investment trusts, for example, that invest in those types of real assets. But um, if, if you want to go down the illiquid route, that's, that's, the, that's the pure play. Otherwise, you're going to have to take some extra risk on Tony, I think the answer is see Angie afterwards outside. Yeah. You might miss the football game. I know you're one of those fans. Is it, David, do you have a question? Yes. Is there a point in having a low, uh, a low risk portfolio as all it does is cover the inability that uh, inflation has been over the last few years? Sorry, I'm not sure. Can, yeah. you, can you say that again? What I'm asking is this. <laughs> if one has a low risk portfolio, if all it does is cover the even low risk inflation that has been over the last four years, is there a point in having it? Yeah, I think, I think part of that question is compliance related because when we start getting definitions of low and high risk yeah. in this industry, the regulator has their own views as to what is high and low risk. And once the box are ticked as to low risk, the only certain assets one can own. Um, I share your sentiment, but then one, again, sitting outside this, one has to look at people's circumstances as to what risk they could or couldn't take. And, and it's a highly, again, it's saying, David, that feel free to talk to someone individually afterwards, but it's very much compliance driven. Anthony? The, the new fund that you're raising money for, what is what what is the target? Okay, I'll let Jared answer, but just one clarification. It's not a fund. None of these are funds. It's an individual client portfolio. So you as a client can own those 7 or 8 or 12 stocks on your own. But in terms of returns, Jared? Uh, double digit. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, uh, it's not going to be single digit. Uh, I mean, we're not looking to launch a hugely volatile portfolio, but uh, we hope that taking slightly more risk, we want to get a return you know, in the teens. Correct. Um, we are currency agnostic in all our portfolios. Um, so those two that we showed you are, you know, if you're a sterling investor, you will have maybe 50% of your portfolio in sterling, um, and the rest in dollar, euro, or Swiss franc, whatever it may be. Um, we will look where the opportunities are. Uh, so from that point of view, yes, uh, you may lose money on currency. But hopefully, in the basket, it all washes and you've made substantial gains. No hedge. No hedge. Any other questions? Okay, th thank, I just want to thank all of you for coming. As I said, there are refreshments outside, and we're all available if there are any other questions you want to talk or ask individually. Thanks very much. Thank